think we're going to be flooded here. Um, first one up, right over here. Okay, how did I come up with my characters, and why did I choose Chicago? Um, for Harry Dresden himself, uh, I put him together um, following a checklist that a that that, that uh, uh, my writing teacher had on a worksheet that was for one of her uh, lectures, of, and the lecture was entitled "How to Construct a Protagonist." And uh, uh, I, I basically I wanted to prove to her how wrong she was about everything. So one semester I said, okay, this semester I'm just going to be your good little writing monkey. I'm going to fill out all your worksheets and do all the things. You're going to see what terrible, awful, cookie-cutter, pablum crap comes out of that kind of writing process, uh, which is uh, when I wrote the first book, The Dresden Files. Um, so about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah which, have, you, have you noticed you the humor? Yeah. Uh, Jim's whole career is basically just saying fuck you to, to everyone else out there. <laughs> yeah! Yeah, I've, I've, that's why I'm, I'm, I, I try and not be the guy who takes myself too seriously because, you know, I'm basically this idiot that's just stumbled into things and uh, gotten a little bit lucky and then, and then at least I like to think that I recognized I had gotten lucky and, and worked really hard to make it happen. Uh, but, but Harry Dresden, the name itself, I was watching TV one night and uh, uh, there were, I, I had just watched a, a videotape of one of my favorite movies uh, uh, at the time, which was uh, Cast a Deadly Spell. And the... Yeah, it was, it was, it was, which is a fun movie. And uh, the tape had, spot, had, had, had started skipping, or not skipping, but it, got, it would stop, and I would rewind it, try and play past it, and it wouldn't go past. But at this part where, in, in, in that movie, where the guy goes, uh, the main character, Fred Ward's character, uh, uh, H. Philip Lovecraft, shows up to, uh, uh, to, the, to the gangster bar, and the gangster, the, the gangster's henchman comes walking up to him and says, Hey, Harry, Harry wants to see you. And, and Fred Ward goes, Oh, Harry wants to see me. Harry wants to see you now. And, and, and then what I got to hear about six times as I tried to fast forward past the stuck part of the tape was, Harry wants to see me. Harry wants to see me. Harry wants to see Like that. Um, and then I said, Okay, heck with that. I'm going to have to try and find something on normal television, which I hate because there's commercials. And... Uh, so I'm skipping through channels. It's like 11.30 on uh, a Friday night in Kansas City. And, and I actually find a channel that's showing uh, reruns of Babylon 5. It's like, okay, acceptable. Uh, and I'm watching the, uh, Amazon, uh, the episode of Amazon 5 and you know, with this hair he wants to see in, in my head. And then a Box Lightner is on there playing his character with the gravelly Box Lightner voice. And, and he's, there, he's there talking about uh, various military attacks that have happened throughout history. And one of the attacks that he mentions as he's going through this monologue is Dresden. Harry wants to Dresden. It's just stuck in my head. Harry wants to Dresden. I'm like, okay, fine, Harry Dresden, character name. Get out of my head. <laughs> And that's where the name came from. Um, when I put the character together, I said, okay, this guy is a wizard detective. Uh, so I said, okay, let's take a wizard, Gandalf. Let's take a detective, Sherlock. I mean, I mean come on. I, I could not get any more obvious in terms of you know, picking archetypical choices and, and started uh, pulling these attributes from each of them. So I made him tall and skinny like Sherlock and, and, and grumpy like Gandalf, you know, smart and grumpy like Gandalf. And uh, that was pretty much where the character came from. Um, Chicago. Murphy, I needed somebody who was his, uh, uh, you know, who was going to be sort of an ally slash uh, uh, opponent and antagonist in the first book. Uh, uh, and I had been really impressed at an Aikido demonstration uh, at OU that year that I'd seen maybe two weeks before where this little five foot tall woman, five foot tall, she was about five foot tall, about 45, um, called three of the uh, uh, defensive linemen from OU up onto the stage <laughs> as part of the demonstration. And they're like, okay, tackle me. And, and she just dumped these guys everywhere. I mean, it was just flying ar arms and legs. And, and, and she'd, like get have, she'd like throw them all on the floor and then be like, and now I run away. And then, okay, get up and do it again. Okay, and, whoop, 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 and now I run away. Whoop, 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 and now I run away, like that. And I was like, wow, that is so cool. So Murphy was, was born there. Um, Bob the Skull was an inside joke between me and my writing teacher. Uh, I was working on chapter, th on chapter two, two or three, and, and she's like, okay, you're going to have to be explaining how some of this magic works. I said, yeah, I've got this character, this assistant character, who I think is, is, is going to be working with Harry, who's going to help him. Uh, and Harry's going to consult with him, and so we'll be able to get, you know, I'll be able to use the joy of idiocy principle to get uh, uh, information dispersed there. And she's like, okay, well, fine, do that as long as you don't make him a talking head. <laughs> Writing 
trap for a character who shows up and spews information but otherwise has no other role. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I made him a literal talking head named Bob, and when I showed up with that chapter and she read it, she looks at me and she says, you think you're very clever, don't you? <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, and, and it, almost all of them come from stuff like that. Um, some characters are I, I only needed for a minute. Some characters uh, that I only needed for a minute were actually too cool and I had to keep them. Uh, butters. Uh, <laughs> And there are still there are characters who surprise me with how memorable or how difficult or how surly they are uh, in terms of trying to get them to do what I need them to do. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that, I mean, now I, I, I kind of grab characters when they when the, when the mood strikes me, and I try and recycle a lot um, because you know I, I went to a lot of work to try and create these people, and and so you know by God I'm going to get my mileage out of them. Um, <laughs> plus, it's more fun when you get to when you get to see folks show up again. Uh, Morty the Ectomancer, the, the Ectomancer was originally a throwaway character, uh, hmm. but you know at the same time I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'm going to be having Dresden running around as a ghost. I think I got to get that Ectomancer back in here. I mean, I went to all the trouble to make him, uh, uh, so you know uh, he'll be you know he'll be playing a role in the upcoming book. All right, uh, I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Um, could you explain free will to us from Bob's perspective? Free will from Bob's perspective. Bob thinks free will is a complete illusion uh, uh, since he doesn't really have it. Um, uh, that, that mortal, it's a conceit that mortals uh, have that, to make themselves feel like they can be in control of things. Uh, uh, but really, it doesn't actually exist. That's Bob's take on it. Um, uh, but then again, as I said, Bob doesn't really have free will. He sort of. Uh, he said up. that Lash got it. What? He said that Lash got it. Lash isn't Bob. No, well, no, but he said Lash got obtain free will. Yeah, Bob doesn't have to tell the truth to Dresden. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, uh, but Bob offered it as a possible explanation, but, you know, I mean, Bob's, a, Bob's essentially, he's a theoretician. Okay. Uh, he, I mean, that's what he does. He's a, he, explain this. Okay, well, maybe it was this. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, he tries to stay out of the whole anything like, anything that verges on morality, Bob tries to avoid uh, uh, you know, speaking with any authority on it because he doesn't have any kind of compass himself. Uh, uh, it all depends on who ha actually happens to be in possession of the skull at the time. So, uh, Let's go over this way. Anyone over here? Yeah. When you're playing City of Heroes with Dresden, does he have a hat? He does not. <laughs> and the number one question I get asked when I play City of Heroes with Dresden is, where's his hat? <laughs> Um, yeah. uh, yes, what happens when Bob gets let out of his skull? Uh, uh, when Bob gets let out of his skull, um, whatever he can get away with, basically. Uh, that's why Dresden's usually careful to throw some terms on there. Uh, although, although uh, 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 depending on, on, on who lets him out and what gets done, we're going to have some more fun with that next book. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> Why does Toot Toot keep getting bigger? Why does Toot Toot keep getting bigger? Why does Toot Toot keep getting bigger? Pizza. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a good answer. Because I'm not going to tell you. Um, I, I, will t I will tell you, however, that uh, uh, the she don't start out as she. And leave it at that. <laughs> 